well done to you at home. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a song that we sang a couple of times uh, last month and uh, we're not putting the words on the screen. This is one of those ones I'd sort of like us to know by heart. And it, the words are... <laughs> Give us hearts to know you, Lord, to know who you are. We will be your people and you our God and you our God. So if you remember it, join in straight away. Otherwise, join in on the second time. Give us hearts to know you. children of Abraham, descendants, part of the many nations that God promised to him. We gather to worship the Lord our God, the maker of the stars, the one who calls us to follow. And we gather united in our love for God and we offer this time of worship. Let's sing together, to God be the glory.
So welcome to worship everybody on this last day of summer. <laughs> Did you notice? <laughs> and are you as thankful as I am for the, the rain that's um, nurtured our garden? Welcome to the first Sunday of restrictions eased again. So the mask advice is am a bit ambiguous for churches, uh, but it is highly recommended if we're singing that we, um, that we have masks for church. So uh, it's up to you really. Um, we're sort of saying, okay, it's highly recommended. We'll, we'll say we'll go with that, but if you don't want to, um, this time Jeff's not going to run around and insist. He's not going <laughs> to come around. <laughs> In Jeff's style, which is so <laughs> pushy. And welcome to the second Sunday in Lent. Uh, so many themes going on in the readings today. Um, and I was just looking back over my sermon again this morning, and uh, so I apologise in advance if it goes a little bit everywhere and tries to take bits, but. Let's, um, let's hope God can do something in your uh, heart and mind with it. Uh, it is also the end of my second month here. Uh, and uh, I'm still meeting new people this morning, which, uh, which is great. And I'm not game <laughs> to say welcome to worship because it might be somebody who's been coming here for many decades. <laughs> and uh, I don't feel I'm the welcomer. Uh, but I'm feeling, still feeling very welcomed myself and um, it's great to have a... I, I don't know how long Jotham's been linked in with the band or anything, but it's great to have a, a, a flute. Um, it just adds that uh, extra tone as well, well uh, especially when we're... Uh, I, I love the way we, there's a team here and people easily come and feel part of it and if they're, they're not able to be here for certain things they, they still easily come back and uh, on Friday we had Steve, what's Steve's surname? Parker. Parker come back and um, helping with the community uh, care and yeah he's just part of that team and this is part of where he volunteers even though he's worshipping somewhere else now. It's, um, it's a lovely feature um, as you're probably aware, but as a newcomer, I can tell you that it's, um, it is a lovely feature of this place, that easy, we belong, great place to belong. You should use that phrase. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's also the weekend of the Synod of Vic Taz meeting this weekend, and um, and so let's just be mindful of the, the people trying to, to lead us and to help us in our um, ministry and mission here as they're um, making decisions and considering um, things on behalf of Vic and Taz uh, churches. And Nicole Mugford, who came last week, uh, who lives not far away, she's, she's at home online helping to run that. She's on the facilitating committee for the Synod she really appreciated um, the welcome that she had here uh, last Sunday. So, um, good one. We'll probably see a bit more of Nicole here. Um, let's have our prayer of adoration and confession. Creating God, we praise you for your word, which called the universe into being and for your spirit, which breathed life into your human creation made in your image. We praise you that in your love, you seek to embrace us in our brokenness, that while your only son was handed over to death, you raised him to life, a new creation by which you rec recreate each of us, as we believe in hope and accept in faith, source of life, Word of life, breath of life, we worship you. Amen. Believe Christ's word of grace to us. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Hey Charlie, how was school this week? Pretty good. Do you want to tell anybody anything that was fun or interesting that happened? No? No? Yep. Okay. If I do this on here, whoops, it's not working very well. Try that green one that I tested earlier. Here we go. Have you done letters, started doing letters of the alphabet at school? Can you recognise that one? Can you tell us what that one is? The letter G. The letter G. Now you know that letter is the first letter in my name, Graham. So if I was going to write the rest of my name, it would be G and then an R and then a A and then a H and then an A. What do you think the last letter might be? Mm. M. Well done. Yeah, you know your letters. Graham, that is my name and I found out during the week that it has a meaning and the meaning is grey house. Do you, th <laughs> do you think I look like a grey house, Jelly? <laughs> grey house or gravelly residence or something like that. So I was pretty disappointed with that when I found out. <laughs> So I think I'll change my name. I think I'll change my name to John. <laughs> is that a good idea? Not a good idea. Why is that not a good idea? Why not? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually you're pretty switched on. I am. Um, my middle name is John, and my dad's name is John. And my grandfather's name was John Norman, though he was called Jack, and, um, and often called Norm as well. Do you know the first letter for your name? Can you see? Can you draw it for us on, on that one there? Oh, I've taken the lid off, so it should work. See how you go. Well done. <laughs> Lovely C. Do you know the rest of your... You do, already. That's five. Can you show me? interesting meaning for your name that you are willing to share with us? Who knows the meaning of their name? What's yours, Charlene? It's um, French for little womanly one. Little womanly one, Charlene. <laughs> Lovely. What's yours? Um, well, part of Abigail. Um, Father's joy. Father's joy. Beautiful. And... Amanda is to be loved. But what's the meaning of the name? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Well, I was given the name of Postman Pat. <laughs> the, guys, the, in the, kitchen at the workers in the kitchen at Parkdale <laughs> named you Postman Pat. <laughs> That's a fun name, isn't it? Look at this. Can, can I show everybody how you can write your name? already after just a few weeks at, um, at school. Wow. Do you know what Charlie means? Do you know what Charlie means? No. I lo it's a good one. <laughs> Free man, according to what I looked up. Yes. Cheryl is the female version. So is Cheryl free woman? Do you know what the meaning is it? 
No. For, yeah. There you go. So it's interesting. Some some names have um, meanings that are pretty cool like that. There was um, there was one name that we were thinking about calling our son, um, but it turned out it meant um, warrior or fighter, Charlie. And so we decided not to call him that name. <laughs> we didn't want a, f a fighter. So very well done. Do you reckon you could use some of these things and make your name look pretty good around there, like um, give it a bit of a frame and um, maybe even do a little bit of a picture of you um, on there that, um, that you could keep or you could give to me if you wanted to. Does that sound alright? Good names actually pretty important to us, aren't they? And in the story, in the Bible story we've got today, it's a funny old story because two people get their names changed. A guy called Abram gets his name changed to Abraham. Ah, it might, you've got your first Bible there. I reckon that story might even be in there pretty early on. It might be. The people will be. Let's have a quick look. Presented to, written by you as well. So isn't that a cool one? And let's see if we can find Abraham. There's the story of Adam. There's the story of Noah. Do you remember that's the story we did last week? Do you remember that with the, all those animals and we sang that funny old song? Rained and rained for 40 days. And then we've got the Tower of Babel. And then we've got Isaac. And it says, Abraham was God's special friend. God told Abraham and his wife Sarah to move to another country. And God promised to do good things for them. Abraham obeyed God. He knew God would help him. And he was not afraid. There we go. That's the people that we're thinking about today and how they got their name changed from Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. Cool. What a good little Bible you've got there. A couple of weeks ago we sang a song called Walking Down the Road and it, just to remind you, it goes like this. Walking down the road, walking down the road, walking down the road with you. And do you remember what we did then? Something a bit funny, a bit silly. Yeehaw! <laughs> yes, I'm walking down the road, walking down the road, walking down the road with you. <laughs> now, if you want to sneak in an extra yeehaw, you can. <laughs> but the song only has it written in the middle there. So it goes. And the verse goes. When the day has begun and the darkness is done and my eyes see the sky so blue I put on my clothes and I'm ready to go Walking down the road with you Ready for the chorus? So I'm walking down the road Oh, a few people got it So I'm walking down the road Walking down the road Walking down the road with you Yeehaw! Yes, I'm walking down the road Walking down the road Walking down the road with you Oh, stay by my side, Jesus, you be my guide Don't you know how I trust in you? Show me where I should call Pick me up when I fall I'm walking down the road with you So I'm walking down the road Walking down the road Walking down the road with you Yeehaw! Yes, I'm walking down the road Walking down the road Walking down the road with you Well done.
We've got some good country western people here. Let's, um, let's listen to that story about Abram and Sarah and, um, and also a story about Jesus. We have both kinds of music here. <laughs> um, so the first reading is uh, from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 7, and then five actually, 15 actually to 17, not 16. Graham asked me to sneak in another verse. <laughs> when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants. Abram bowed down with his face touching the ground and God said, I make this covenant with you. I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram but Abraham because I am making you the ancestor of many nations. I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in the future. I will give you many descendants and some of them will be kings. You will have so many descendants that they will become nations. I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in future generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. God said to Abram, Abraham, you must no longer call your wife Sarai. From now on, her name is Sarah. I will bless her and I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will become the mother of nations and there will be kings among her descendants. Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground. But he began to laugh when he thought, can a man have a child when he is a hundred years old. Can Sarah have a child at 90? The New Testament reading is from Mark uh, chapter 8, verses 31 to 38, and it follows on from the moment when Jesus is asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples, the son of man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He will be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. He made this very clear to them. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus turned around, looked at his disciples and rebuked Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. Your thoughts don't come from God, but from human nature. Then Jesus called the crowd and his disciples to him. If any of you want to come with me, he told them, you must forget yourself, carry your cross and follow me. For if you want to save your own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for me and for the gospel, you will save it. Do you gain anything if you win the whole world but lose your life? Of course not. There is nothing you can give to regain your life. If you are ashamed of me and of my teaching in this godless and wicked day, then when the Son of Man, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. 
our God, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. So as we said, it's the, the second Sunday in Lent, and in Lent we're focusing on discipleship, as are lots of people following that tradition. What does it mean, discipleship, and how are we going with it? And we had that skit with Peter examining himself to lead us into it. And we've got a couple of readings today that you've now heard that really are centrepieces in the understanding for the Jewish and then for the Christian traditions of um, what it means to be a disciple of God, be a disciple of Jesus. So, I will make my covenant with you, Abram hears from God. Obey me and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants. It's such a weird reading, according to my daughter, Rachel, as we talked about it yesterday. Yeah, it is. But it can be a really helpful one in wrestling with the particular question that we started tackling last Sunday that's closely related to discipleship. First, a little historical background that might help. In the ancient world, when a king conquered another people, he might make a peace treaty covenant, like, I will protect you from your enemies and provide for you. You will pay me taxes, obey my laws, and stay loyal to me. And if you don't, I'll withdraw my protection and my provision. That's our covenant, our agreement, decided by me, <laughs> the conqueror. So when Abram has his spiritual experience where he gets overwhelmed by the presence of creator God, universal God, he's, he's unusual for his time in having a sense that there's one almighty God. So when he has that experience, the relationship for him seems like one of these peace treaty covenants. The, the powerful king is laying down the terms for Abram for peaceful, productive relating together. Now the question we introduced last week was, what on earth is God doing with evil, with sin and suffering and with us? And the, the answer or the answers in the Bible involve stories that are weaved together in a big story and signposted with these things, covenants. So last week we considered the first covenant and Charlie remembered that story with the Noah story and can show it in the new Bible. And at the end of that story, what was the symbol what was the what was at the end of the story in the sky? Do you remember, Charlie? What was it at the end? The colourful rainbow in the sky that was going to be a reminder to G, to God that God promised never again will I destroy the world with a flood. Noah's done his bit. God doesn't demand anything in return for God's promises of restraint. So it's a slightly different covenant. And as the story goes, the point of it is that even if humans totally deserve it again, God is not going to wipe out our evil and sin by destruction. So, if God's not going to do it like that, what on earth is God doing? And the second biblical covenant in today's reading gets us moving. God chooses a couple who are open to relationship with God to make another new beginning. Noah and his, fa his family and descendants actually didn't do a great job after the flood. So in Genesis chapter 12, God chooses Abram and Sarai to make a difference. This is part of what God does. This is how God does it. 
the creator God prompts and equips people to help achieve God's creative life-giving purposes in order to counter evil and sin and suffering. So Abram and, sent, Abram and Sarai sensed that this loving universal spirit was reaching out to them and saying, leave your homeland, go on a journey to a new place and trust me. Through you I will fill the earth with people and bless the world. And they had enough faith to give it a go. And they had some remarkable adventures, strange and scary on their journey, and God helped them along. But they didn't have any children, except for Ishmael, who was a son for Abram with Sarai's servant girl, Hagar. Now that sets up a whole other stream of the story, which is awful and important and fascinating at the same time. We'll explore that another day. In Genesis 17, Abram is how old? 99. We haven't got anybody quite there yet, have we? No. Abram's not. Sarai is 90. We do have some people who get that. And God reiterates that God is making a covenant with them and they will have multitudes of descendants. He's going to do his recreating, filling the world with people through them. And to emphasise this, their names get tweaked. And so Abram meant something like father, but Abraham means father of multitudes and Sarah means princess. But Abram's 99. Sarah's 90. So it's ridiculous that they will have children. So I understand why Abraham starts laughing. And thanks for adding in the, um, the extra rogue verse for me, Peter, at the end, where it spells out that Abram's laid down to worship God, but then he starts to laugh. This is so silly that we should have a child. But that seems to be the point. Don't worry about the biological facts and figures. This is going to be a miraculous birth, a God thing. God is involved in this, creating new life and creating potential for overcoming evil, sin and suffering. And you know what? I reckon we have similar sorts of miracles going on in this church every week. People who have reached Sarah's age, or just about, still serving God's purposes in all sorts of ways. Helping to overcome evil and sin and suffering through compassion, commitment and faith. And here we are, spiritual descendants of Abram and Sarai. Didn't think they'd have children, thought this multitudes of nations thing was, was, um, was pretty f- far-fetched. But 4,000 years later, a couple of billion people identify as children of Abram and Sarah. So, what on earth is God doing about evil and suffering? God chooses people like you and me to make a difference together. Sometimes we do it well, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it just seems ridiculous and we're hopelessly in need of reorienting and encouraging and even a miracle, a sign from God. So we know and we trust that God sent Jesus with this message. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is very near. Turn back towards God's goals of peace and justice and discover the power of God's ways. And so we know from the gospel stories how people are drawn to Jesus. And then we get this, the dramatic moments and teaching that we read in today's gospel reading. Jesus announces to his disciples... God's way to deal with evil, sin and suffering through Jesus 
will not include destruction or violence. Yes, he's going to be their Messiah, but not with destruction and violence and overthrowing the Romans the way they thought. In fact, Jesus himself must suffer and die, then be raised again to new life, demonstrating God's victory over evil and sin and suffering and death. So Peter thinks, this is ridiculous. He takes Jesus aside and rebukes him for such stupid talk about having to suffer and die. And Jesus rebukes him right back (laughs) and puts him in his place. Get behind me. It's satanic talk to tempt me away from this self-sacrificing route, which is God's way of dealing with evil and sin and suffering. I'm reminded of a comment by a wise and funny lady in my first congregation. And she said, there are plenty of people who are ready to serve God in an advisory capacity. (laughs) After Jesus' disagreement with Peter, he turns to the crowds who are wanting to join this Jesus group And they've been attracted by Jesus' words and his actions that match those words, the healing, the reconciling, the including, the casting out of demons of all kinds. It really seems like the kingdom of God is near. But Jesus makes it very clear to them, if they want to join in, they have to do it God's way. There's no promises of status or power or popularity or even obvious great success right now. If you want to come with me on this mission, he says, you have to forget yourself or deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That's the way we defeat the power of evil, sin and suffering and receive our truest fulfilling life. So it is a privilege for me to share with you at Coatesville Uniting Church on this journey. And I've already seen so many examples of how you just take for granted that you will give what you can for others, especially those most in need. That is forgetting yourself and taking up your cross. You're also alert to how God might want you to make a difference in your family or the wider community. And like Abram and Sarah, you're willing to give it a go. And I believe you're also willing to pay the price of rejection or disappointment or loss if you're working in the cause of God's justice and compassion. That too is forgetting yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus. Discipleship. You give up control of your life and satisfying what you immediately want for yourself, for Jesus and the sake of the gospel. And so you receive life, abundant life, and the world gets blessed. You don't do it perfectly, of course. We get it wrong, plenty. But that reminds us that we can't do it on our own, with our own strength or in our own wisdom. Jesus' disciples, we are covenant people. We're in a partnership, an agreement with God and with God's people. So what on earth is God doing about evil and sin and suffering? God is working in and through God's people to overcome it with self-sacrificing love, creativity and goodness as modelled 
by Jesus. May God bless our efforts to be part of that team and that journey. And may we know the life that God promises that we receive when we give our life to that cause. Amen. We worship God with our offering and sing the prayer of St Francis. of Christ we bring our diverse gifts some financial gifts in cash some electronic some other gifts obviously apparent and some not so let your Holy Spirit breathe life into our serving so that all we do brings glory to your name Amen So prayers of the people has some words from Jeff Schrouder. God of covenant, whose faithfulness and promise are everlasting, let your spirit whisper your faithfulness to the oppressed and grieving and your promise to those who fear the terror of the night or the trial of daily life. Let your word speak hope to the distressed Do not hide your face from those who call on your name, those we have named today, those we name in our hearts, and those whose troubles are known only to you. Loving God of all generations, hear the cries of our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord of creation, to you be all praise. Let's sing. Oh, 
assured of the transforming power of God, the gracious love of our Lord Jesus Christ and the renewing strength of the Holy Spirit within you and upon you. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.